Claire Armstrong from News Corp Australia. You talked about the primary goal of The Voice not being about the feeling everyone has on the night of the referendum. But with this proposal, there is an element that isn't about practicality. It's been lamented what kind of Australia we would wake up to the day after an unsuccessful referendum. And in fact, despite being critical of the wording released last month, Professor Greg Craven said, and I'm going to quote, I would vote for it because if I was forced to take a position as to the sort of advanced morality of doing justice to our Indigenous brothers and citizens, I could not vote against it. I wonder what do you think it would say about Australia and what message it would send to Indigenous Australians if the voice vote failed? And, and do you agree with Professor Craven that there is a moral impetus here to support it regardless of your legal re reservations? Well, look, I, I think the first thing to say is that we shouldn't be putting a referendum if it's in any danger of failing. That's the first thing. The government should not be putting the country through this. But secondly, a referendum is about changing the constitution. And the Constitution is for keeps. So we have to look carefully about, at the words that are being put into the Constitution. We have to consider their legal ramifications because the, the sugar hit that we will get on the, the night of the referendum or the day after will soon dissipate if the body is not serving the interests of Indigenous Australians and is not working in the way that it's intended. I want to see a, a situation where... Um, we're only putting a question if it's, if it's guaranteed a success. I don't think we should be putting a question uh, if there's a chance for failure, and I think the Prime Minister needs to reflect on that. But what does it say? Well, I, I, as I say, there seemed to be bipartisan consensus before the last election that the worst thing that could happen was that a referendum could be put that failed. Um, now we've got a Prime Minister who seems to have eschewed bipartisanship and said he could go it alone. Um, I think... This ultimately isn't about what the parties do here in Canberra. It's ultimately about what, what the Australian people do. And I think Australians should be very uh, circumspect in amending their constitution. Ken Wyatt, Ken Wyatt says that if your party goes to the no camp, that you're going to be seen by the world as racist. Your own former colleague in Parliament. Well, I've got great respect for Ken Wyatt. But there are reasons to have pause in relation to this referendum that have nothing to do with race and everything to do with the constitutional structure of our government. And the failure of process, I'll just make this last point, the failure of process here has meant that there hasn't been enough consensus built. There hasn't been um, working on whether this is the right model to put forward to the Australian people. Andrew Previn. Mr Lisa, you've talked today about the prospect of an activist high court taking a somewhat expan uh, <coughs> expansive view of what the, the voice can do. This might be another way of expressing what Keith Wallahan said recently in that there's a fear that the High Court would interpret the amendment as an implied obligation to consult the voice. Mm. Would you support the voice if there was an extra clause added that said something on, along the lines of there is no obligation on the executive government to consult the voice? Well, look, I think I've, I've articulated a view, Andrew, that I think these matters are all ultimately left, better left to the parliament than put in the, in the constitution. I think you get the vibe of the I, I, I get the vibe of where you're going, but I also don't think we should draft the constitution at the National Press. I'm not asking or, you to, or, but I'm... I'm as, uh, as good clearly, a this is about non-justiciability, non yeah. and this would be another way to do that. Well, there are many ways to skin the cat. I mean, uh, part of the point that I've made here is that because there hasn't been a process, people like Father Frank Brennan, who've suggested alternative ways of doing this, or the Sydney Barrister Louise Clegg, or the 18 different views of how you could do this that we, uh, that, that we got at the Joint Select Committee in 2018, have never been considered. Uh, the government has put forward this one particular view, and we're kind of mucking around at the edges here. Uh, I think the, the, that the sensible thing to do is to have a look closely at the words that are there, but to consider do we really need that particular provision in the Constitution? What's the point of, of putting the voice in the Constitution? It's threefold. Firstly, because it's what constitutional recognition now means. Secondly, it's to give some permanency. But thirdly, and this was always the point, that it would ultimately be a matter for Parliament to adjust and change what the voice did in accordance with circumstances. If we lock in these, these matters in the Constitution today, we cannot change them. That's the issue. 